Hello and welcome to part one of Python Absolute Beginner. This is module one, the introduction. And today you are going to get your first taste of Python from a structured learning approach. You don't have to have had any background in programming. This will walk you through basics that will enable you to do some real things and do so within just a short period of time. So first of all, I have got the code cloned to my computer. So it's in my documents GitHub Python teaching code folder. And inside of that folder, you can see here, Python Absolute Beginner is a subfolder. I've navigated to that. If you are on a Windows machine, that will not necessarily, if I go back here to the root folder, you see I've got a documents folder sitting here. If you're on a Windows machine, you might have to go into your OneDrive folder and find the documents folder there because you might have mapped your documents directly to OneDrive. Sometimes that happens automatically with Windows. So know that. And then when you go into documents, you'll find your GitHub. And then after you find your GitHub, you'll find your Python teaching code. And then you'll find Python Absolute Beginner. And once you're in there, you go ahead and click on module one. And that's what I've done over here. So I've, I, it takes a moment to load. Once it's loaded, you look for this open circle up here. And notice it says kernel is idle. That means it's ready. I've gone ahead and clicked to trust this notebook. That means to let it run the code and do things like that. Uh, trusted mode gives the notebook a little more permission on the system. And I'm comfortable with that. So I go ahead and do that. All right, and now to begin with, we're gonna learn how to navigate around a Jupyter Notebook. Uh, you've learned a little bit from prior videos looking at it, but basically this is a code editor running in a browser, and I can go and restart the uh, kernel, which is the engine that runs the code. I can add cells here. I notice I can tell which ones to run. I can change the types of cells. So when I click in a cell, I can change. I can actually uh, go in and insert more cells, a cell above or below, or I could use these uh, character keys in order to do that. So there, there are a number of things on the menus here, uh, and the instructions are telling you how to get started with some of that. So when I scroll down and we start seeing, the very first thing says we're going to print something to the screen. And what we're going to do is we're going to print to what is called the standard output. Standard output on a computer operating system is a shared location where different computer systems can listen to each other and put output and pass it back and forth. And it's sort of a strange concept, but you've got a link here. You can read about it on Wikipedia if you want to and that will give you some more information about it. But just know that's where the print statement is going to send whatever you tell it to print. It's not sending it to a printer per se. It's going to route it to the standard output on the computer where the Python engine is running. And so down here, notice it says try to show hello programmer. And notice it tells me how to run the cells. Press Control Enter. So when I go down here and I run this example and I hit control enter, I see that a number showed up. So do you see how if I zoom in, this number was not in these square brackets until I ran this. I, I clicked down here and I hit command return and I just ran it again. And when I ran it, an asterisk briefly showed up in these square brackets showing that the engine was busy with the code in that cell. And then after it was done, it told me the order in which it had been run in this notebook. So it's the second thing that's been run in this notebook now. The first thing was this cell also. I just ran it twice. And the importance of that is that whatever has run, sometimes that will put things into a data structure like a variable uh, can be in a data, uh, a container for data. And now I know that that container is full and I can use it somewhere else. So this is useful to pay attention to. If the asterisk had stayed and not gone away, that might mean that I have clogged up the 
engine for Python. And if that's the case, I would go back up here and restart my, uh, I could do interrupt, I could do restart, or if I do restart and clear all output, it will clear out the word here. So if I, I'll just do that right now. Here we go. I'll see that it's busy it, for a moment. The Python kernel was busy with a solid black dot. Now it's done. Now the number is gone from my square brackets. And if I run this again, I see that I get the same result. And so I can also do print hello programmer as instructed up above. Let me go ahead and capitalize that. And now I'm going to click uh, Command Return or Control Enter on a Windows machine. And I get Hello Programmer. So I can do that. There are several ways to run cells. I prefer that you use the Control Enter because it keeps you right there. But you could also come up here and hit Run. That'll do it too. As long as you've highlighted the cell you want to run. Comments are very important for programmers. So this next section talks about the pound symbol. When a pound symbol is used in the leftmost location of a code line, anything to the right of it will be treated as a comment and therefore not executed by the Python engine. So when I run this cell, nothing happens. So if I were to come down here and say pound print hello world, and now I run this cell, nothing happened because this pound symbol marks everything to the right of it as just a comment. And that's how programmers tell future programmers or even remind themselves of details about the code, whether it's a future feature that needs to be developed or a bug that is in there or anything of that nature. That's how they do that. So keep that in mind, and uh, it will enable you to be able to do a variety of things uh, by, by having comments. Good code will have comments in it to explain what's happening and why it's happening. And I'll expect you to also learn to use comments and to read them. All right. Uh, program hello world with comment at a comment describing the code purpose, so to say hello and create a hello world style message. So you're going to do that here. You're going to make one line as a comment, and the next line will be a print statement, and then you'll run it. And that'll be your first code writing here in the notebook. And notice how we can have explanation. This is called markdown. So if I click in here, I've actually got the textbook itself of this tutorial is written in what is called a markdown cell. So if I come to the cell type, you'll see there is markdown and there is code. And a markdown cell has a specific lingo in order to format text so that it can be legible and useful, sort of like a lightweight Microsoft Word. And if I hit Command Return here and I run this cell, you can see it formats up nicely and presents itself on the screen. So if you ever see the underlying code like this, you see that you can actually run it and get it back to saying you know, the outward message so that it's easy to read. Uh, within Jupyter, we have some different things. So one of the things we have is we actually have Jupyter Notebooks, which is a grouping of code and markdown cells, mostly, and allows us to do the code development and run Python which is uh, very useful. Uh, when we have a notebook, so up here, you can create a new notebook. And so we can also open a book. So over here, I could hit File, New, Python 3 Notebook. These are Python 3 notebooks. And because they're Python 3, you'll notice the Python 3 engine up here. Notebooks can be of different types if you have different types enabled but you guys by default will only see the Python type available. But we can create, create our own notebooks. So companies that do data analytics in the cloud, they frequently do actually put their code into notebooks and they will use those for extraction, translation, loading, processing, uh, in-stream, all sorts of different things they'll do with these, uh, this style of Python programming. 
Uh, and as mentioned earlier, there are a couple types of cells. We've got edit mode, and then we've got the actual running of the, uh, of the cells. You've already seen markdown cells and what their editing looks like and, and how it looks when you run them. Uh, when you save cells, it's useful to go ahead and hit Control S, or you can go to the menu, file, save, checkpoint. I'm going to go ahead and save right now, and you're going to see up here it says last checkpoint 12 minutes ago, and I'm going to hit save, and all of a sudden I just hit Command S, or it'd be Control S on Windows, and now I, it says last checkpoint a few seconds ago. So there's the way you do that, and now I'm going to run this cell again, and voila. So you're learning how to navigate around a notebook. We can add cells to, and we can choose the type of a cell. So by default, new cells will be code, but we can add more markdown as well. And so here uh, we can go, and it says they want me to insert a new cell. So to add a cell, I could go to insert. I can hit insert above. I can hit insert below. And that's basically what it says. Add print with the message after edit save. So then is asking that you go into one of these cells and add these, add this, uh, the code to make that happen. Here it says to add another code cell, uh, add print with the message keyboard shortcut uh, to save is S. So go ahead and do that, and you will. Uh, I think you can do that. Here, you, I just showed you uh, how to insert a new cell, so I think you're ready for that. Uh, now, we, we've started to learn about print, but we don't really know what that thing inside the print statement was, the hello world. Well, it turns out it was a string. Uh, and you may be used to string being a sort of lightweight version of a rope, but in computers, we talk about strings as a series of characters, a sequence of characters, like A, B, C, 1, 2, 3, punctuation, etc. And it is one of the primitive data types in Python. So the other types are integers, floats, and booleans. Uh, integers and floats are numbers, and booleans are true or false, or 0, 1. But strings are what we use for words and for any characters that we're not interpreting as numbers or true or false. So strings are a very general use type of data holder. And uh, they have a variety of characteristics we're about to learn about. So anytime we put something in double quotes, it's a string or single quotes. So down here you can see the example. Strings go in single or double quotes. And when we feed them to the print statement, it knows to just pass those to the standard output. So down here, enter a string in print with single quotes. I think you're ready to do that. And do one with double quotes. I think you're ready there. Now, the, the funny thing is, if we don't put the quotes on it, Python will interpret a number as a number. And if there's no decimal point, it's going to be a, an integer. So down here, uh, so it says here, run the above code in the next cell. So if we take these, this code and copy it and then paste it down here and then hit run, they look the same, don't they? Those two things look the same. Hmm. Their type is actually different, but they look the same. So what do we know? How do we know that these are different? And that is something we're about to explore. So for now, this one is an integer. This one is a string because it just represents text characters. It can't be used in math. All right, so here we go. Integers, which are a second primitive data type, are whole numbers not in quotes. So negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, those are all integers. So if I come down here and I run this example, 
they look the same, but actually 299 was an integer, 2017 was a string. And I know that because I see the quotes and I see the lack of quotes. And notice that in Anaconda, the color changes depending on which data type. So if it's a number, it's in green. If it's a string, it's in red. So that should help you to see it. All right, so here print an integer, print a string made of integer characters. So just put it in quotes. There you go. All right. Now, after you do that, let's talk about variables. So variables are a container. You can think about variables like jars or bottles or boxes. Uh, they contain other stuff. And you can make them by putting any kind of word that's not a reserved word in Python. So there are a couple rules about naming variables. You can't start them with a number uh, character. They have to start with an alphabet character, uh, A through Z. And they can't be the same as any of the reserved words in Python. So we have a Python cheat sheet. If you go visit the cheat sheet, you will look up here in this upper corner and you'll see key reserved words in Python 3. So you can't name your variable any of these words. And this is it. These are all those reserved words. And they do special things in the programming language. Just keep those in mind and know that you can go to the cheat sheet and see them if you need them. It's very common when you have a variable name with two words to put an underscore between the words. That increases readability. And generally, variables should be named with lowercase descriptive names. That's good etiquette in Python. So item price, student name, stock symbol. In the world of coding, though, you will see a lot more variety. Some people will try to shorten names as much as possible into acronyms or other things so that it's less typing. Uh, that also works, but it's harder for people who come after you or share code with you to read that code. So the Python community really wants you to use names that people can read and understand uh, without a whole lot of work. And uh, putting the underscore there is like having a space because you can't put a space or the words will be broken up into two separate items. So the, the underscore allows you to have a name that is readable in that manner. All right. To fill up a container, what you do is you name it, like here, current message. You put a single equals sign, and then you choose one of your uh, data types to put into it. So in this case, new current message, which is a string. And as soon as I do that, Python will initialize the current message container, and then it will put the string literal, in other words, the value new current message, it will Put it in so that it's there in the container. So here we go. I'm going to go ahead and run it. And you can see that I got current message I am a string. And then the first time I see I am a string, it was printed directly. The second time I see it, it was the contents of the current message vessel uh, container that got printed into this standard output I am a string. So when you have a variable that holds something, you can pass that to a print statement and reuse it. In fact, I could have done something like put a comma and then done current message a second time and run this cell again. And notice the nice thing about a variable is I can reuse it. I have the value stored in one place, but then I can use it in multiple places. So that is one of the nice things about having something in a variable. I don't have to retype it over and over. Uh, here we can see once again, we're going to reassign the current message. It's going to become run this cell using control enter. And that's going to change what is contained in current message. Now it says run this cell using control enter. And if I comment out, 
the assignment in this one up here and I run this one, look at that. Now this one changes to the new value of current message, the container. That's what's in the container now. And so it printed it up here too. Because it's being stored in the memory on my computer within the Python runtime engine and it can be reused in any location of this notebook now that I've initialized it and filled it up, you know, assigned it. So that, this, this where I've assigned this new message, run this cell using control enter, since I already had something in there, this is called variable reassignment. We've put something new into the, into the variable. Uh, with that, I think you're ready to do task five and I will pause and come back later to give you uh, the next update.